much um, for that reading, uh, ma'am. The, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we must be very clear. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of our faith. Hear me very well and understand me. His purpose for the coming was to die for us. That is the foundation upon which we are saved. But without the resurrection, anything that Jesus did would have been absolutely useless. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is exactly what Paul is explaining. That without the resurrection, we have all followed a fable and a tale. And we have done what amounts to nothing at all. Believing in God, believing in Jesus, we have to understand very clearly that without the resurrection of Jesus, there is no point in believing in God. You need to hear that very well. If there is no resurrection, then there is no hope or relief from sin. That doesn't mean God no longer exists, but it means we now benefit absolutely nothing from his existence. Because we are not going to be relieved from this pain and suffering. It will go on forever. And so the resurrection of Jesus becomes absolutely critical because this resurrection is what then confirms for all of us that for the first time since the Garden of Eden, there is actually now light at the end of the tunnel. Up to that point, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Faith was its own light within the believers. But they held no evidence or reality that things could ever get better for the human race. And when Jesus rises again, that absolutely changed everything. The faith and belief and a hope in a better life no longer became just a faith and a hope and a belief. It was now a cemented and guaranteed reality. Let me put it to you uh, this way. If you are hungry and you know very well there is food in your house, there are two points there. There's you being hungry and you are away from the house. And there's your knowledge that in the house, there is food. But if all your means to get to the food were taken away, you could not reach the house in order to eat. Your knowledge that there is food in the house would not only be useless, but it would amount to some form of torture because you would be intellectually aware of a fact that is not going to be reality in any way, shape, or form. The knowledge of God the knowledge of the scriptures, the knowledge of what he did, the knowledge of Jesus, none of it would have held value had Christ not resurrected. To know there is a God would merely be information for torture because we would be aware that that God can do nothing to relieve us from what we are going through. To know that there is a heaven would have been nothing more than torturous information because 
the existence of those heavens creates no paradise of our own. To know that God is the almighty who created everything in the beginning would have merely been a historical fact of no purpose since he is in no position to create a new life for us. This is why it is so important to understand that the resurrection of Jesus is where everything that is written from Genesis all the way to Revelation chapter 22 is then able to happen. With the resurrection of Jesus, all the actions of God in the Bible are justified. When Jesus rose again, every questionable decision God had made, every ounce of choice that he has been questioned for was justified from why he permitted sin to why he allowed for wars, why he called for the Israelites. Why he would call for the Israelites, for example, to attack and kill other nations. Why David fought Goliath. All of these things that happened in the Old Testament, in and of themselves, they have no definition or, 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 or reason. In the absence of Jesus, they merely become cruel acts of a cruel God. But when Jesus dies and rises again, then every decision finds its position in the plan of grace designed to save all nations while at the same time unfolding itself within the complexities of the great controversy of the choices of those nations. There was the deaths, the hundreds of thousands, certainly millions of animals sacrificed under the Jewish uh, 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 tabernacle system. All of it, the prophets, the prophecies, the exiles, the Daniels and the Jeremiah's, the rebuilding of the temples, the queen of Sheba, the Sodom and Gomorrah, the Abrahams, the justification by faith, the Moseses and the Ten Commandments, all of it. It would have been great historical events. But had Jesus not risen, none of them would have found their proper place in history. Because all of them, every single story in the Bible, and I mean that when I said every single story in the Bible, including those chapters about genealogies, where one thinks, what on earth would I learn from this story? every story in the Bible, they were all, all of them were pieces of a puzzle in the masterpiece painting of grace. All of them, the wars, the death, the David and the Goliaths and the battles with the Amalekites and the Gideons and the Samsons and the Delilahs, all of it in and of itself, has no meaning or purpose, but every single story, it had something to say about the unfolding plan of redemption. On their own, none of these stories 
possess any reason to be treated with divine respect. In the absence of the cross and the resurrection, they are nothing more than mere novels of the Middle East. In the absence of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, they are no different to the epic of Gilgamesh and any other ancient tale of the history of the world. It is the death and the resurrection of Jesus that then brings all these stories together and gives us a final understanding why all these events happened. All of them, all of them were building to a particular point. You see, if you've never had known the book of Matthew to look, which had to only exist because Jesus existed and rose again, you would have never known what is the significance of the story of Rahab and Joshua. The story of Rahab and Joshua means nothing if Jesus doesn't rise again. But when Jesus rises again, Rahab becomes a key figure in God building a lineage for his own birth on earth. If Jesus does not rise again and dies like any other human being, Ruth and Boaz have no purpose. David and Goliath have no significance. The dedicated sanctuary of Solomon has no holiness. But because Jesus died, and more importantly, because he rose from the dead, we now get a panoramic view of the whole Old Testament. And suddenly, all the stories make sense. Suddenly, it makes sense why God said to Manoah and his wife that the child she will conceive shall be called a Nazarene. He shall eat no unclean food and shall not shave his head. Suddenly, the order of the holy Nazarenes makes sense when a Nazarene called Jesus is born and dies and rises again. But had that Nazarene not been born, it was futile to tell us the story of a Nazarene called Samson. If Jesus did not rise from the dead. The story of Uzzah, who died when he touched the ark, would have been nothing more than a mere story of cruelty. But when Jesus is born and is crucified, when what is holy dies, rather than killing what is sinful. You've got to understand that. When in Jesus, the Holy God dies in order to save a sinner, rather than the sinner dying because they've touched the holy thing. In Jesus, the holy finally rescues the sinful. And suddenly, Uza is not meaningless. Uza becomes a critical figure in telling the story of the majesty of God. That this God so holy 
that not even to touch him, just to touch his things kills. The very same God would have people touch the hem of his garment one day and they will no longer die, but they will live. Without Jesus, without his resurrection, this, this would have been a novel. Nothing more. There would have been no ounce of holiness in it. There would have been no divine instruction in these words. What makes all of this Genesis to Malachi to be now read with authority and perspective is that Christ fulfilled all of it in him. And when he rose again, he gave all of it meaning. Because all of it had been testifying about him. And obviously, if he did not die and rise again, the New Testament would not have existed. So there's no reason to even try and introspect what it would have meant. Think about it for a minute. How would the New Testament have read had Jesus not resurrected? What would they have been trying to tell us? What gospel were they going to be preaching? What exactly were we going to be converting to? A man who died but never rose? Then we might as well believe in our own fathers and mothers and saviors because they died and never rose. Our grandfathers and grandmothers would suddenly qualify also to be saviors of the world. If Jesus dies, nothing makes him different. Please hear me very carefully. The death of Jesus doesn't make him the savior of the world. It's his resurrection that makes him the savior. Dying. We all die. I will die. You will die. By dying, he achieves nothing. He merely goes where we are all going. But when he rose again, that, that is where he showed us ultimately that he is more than all of us. That he alone is not only the sum of all of us, but greater than it all. Because in the absence of dead resurrection, what would have set him apart from your dead cousin, your aunt, your mother, your father? What exactly would the story have read? It would have ended in Matthew 27, verse 66. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. That would have been the last thing we knew. And then what? Oh, there was a fancy grave in Judah that was so important the Roman governor assigned soldiers to watch it. Then... We've known graves of kings who assigned soldiers to guard their tombs, to protect the wealth they were buried with. Christ would not have done anything unique by dying. Matthew 28 together with every chapter in the Bible that talks about the resurrection of Jesus. It does not only just speak about the resurrection of one son of God. The story of the resurrection 
is the story of how the history of the world was justified and its future was bought and secured. When Jesus rose that Sunday morning, everything God had ever done in the past was justified. All of it, all of it, even the most controversial parts, the risk God had taken doing all of it, allowing sin to happen, allowing himself to be questioned over it. Why didn't he just kill the devil? Why didn't he just do this? All of it, allowing false gods to rise up for the devil to deceive the world, allowing people to develop theologies that question his very existence, all of it. It was a massive controversial risk. But when Jesus rose again, God's risk paid off. Every decision he had ever made that he had been questioned for, everything he had ever done that had reduced his status as a God into a mere syllabus, in philosophy and theology lectures, when he was the great I am, all those decisions that, that humiliated him to a level that made human beings to think they could study him, or those decisions that he made where human beings killed each other and lost their lives, and he got out of it looking like an evil, cruel God. Every decision he made, building up to the cross of Calvary, when Jesus rose on the third day, all those decisions were finally justified. God had become the greatest risk taker in the universe. And all that risk was pinned on no one but him. There was no one else who could execute it. Not just its Calvary part from the beginning. Because there was no other God. He is the one and only. And he could not entrust this to angels. Lucifer was evidence. Angels can never be relied on to do the things of God. Another human being could have never been called to do this. Adam and Eve were evidence. Humans cannot be relied on to carry the things of God. So he had to bear it all. Each cross he did not just bear on that road, on that Via de la Rosa that day. The cross of our salvation he bore before he made us. Yet when he looked down time, which only he occupies eternally, knowing what we were going to do and the mess it would bring, he still considered creating Lucifer worth it. He still considered creating the universe worth it. And he bore its cross, even to Cal Calvary. All of it relied on one moment. He didn't need many. He needed that one second that would change the future of the universe. When Jesus would with his own lungs, the lungs that were suffocating at the cross, filling up with fluid, dying. Those lungs, they needed to draw breath. Not two times, not three. One breath was needed. If 
he could draw just one breath than everything God had ever done was worth it. And God from that moment could tell us the future because that breath would have secured that future. The resurrection of Jesus is more than just his resurrection. It's the resurrection of the universe. Everything rose with him that day. The future rose with him. Eternity rose with him. Assurance that sin will never rule again rose with him. When Jesus rose, it is not just the resurrection that happened that day. That resurrection was also the final death of some things. That resurrection was the death of sin. That resurrection was the death of suffering. That resurrection was the death of death itself. When Jesus rose, a future that was only known by God, engineered by God, was now a future that humanity and indeed the rest of the world would actually be present in. Beloved, without resurrection, we have no purpose. And what makes my faith and your faith absolutely worth it is that he rose, that he actually rose again that piece of information as easily as its syllables roll on the tongue it is actually a piece of information upon which the eternal clock of life now ticks to say Jesus rose again is such a simple English sentence. In reality, that phrase, Jesus rose from the dead, it's the whole reason why we breathe today. It's, it's the whole reason why we have hope in the midst of pandemics. That phrase that Jesus arose from the dead is the reason why even when we are in a funeral bearing our loved ones. We are heard singing, it is well with my soul. This phrase, this fact, this event. So it was. A crucifixion that began around 
1 a.m. on Friday. And in round about 10, 11 hours later, at three in the afternoon, Jesus breathes his last and cries, it is finished. He is taken down a few minutes later and is put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and he rests on the grave that Friday. He rests on the grave that Sabbath. He rests on the grave as Sunday begins. And somewhere in the early hours, when the earth was performing her revolutions and the sun rays faced towards the Middle East, and the first glimmer of light from the evening stars that are just fading as the early morning comes and those orange yellow rays start to show from the distance and they pierce right over the garden of Gethsemane moving through the top of Mount Zion hitting the top of the city, Jerusalem, onto the other side. In a plantation where the graves of the rich and affluent were, on the limestone graves, and there was the grave of Joseph of Arimathea, sealed with a massive rock. An angel pierces through the sky like lightning, rolls the stone. Jesus walks out, He's not carried out. He walks out, bleeding, wounded. He has wounds on his hands. He has a gaping wound on his side. A miracle has happened. He is back to life. He carries the wounds of death. He possibly bled 60% of his blood in the crucifixion. Now he stands. Why is he not bleeding to death from his wound? Why is he not bleeding again? from where they speared him. Then suddenly, we remember why in John chapter five, he said to the man who was born an invalid, and he said to him, rise, take up your mat and walk. And the Bible says the man rose the man did not volunteer to rise. Power commanded from the mouth of Jesus caused him to rise again. Because the same word that made the universe from nothing into something, the same word that rose the, the daughter of 
Jairus from the dead, the same word that turned an invalid into a fully walking man. That word that became flesh. From death, it had commanded flesh again. And flesh obeyed. As from the beginning, flesh obeyed when he said, let us make man in our image. Christ stood. As Paul would put it, God brought him back to the living. Just as God had brought us to the living from clay. And every other resurrection that had ever taken place in the Bible. Done in faith in advance. It was all justified. The resurrection of Moses. I think of the two widows in the book of Kings whose sons died and were raised by the prophets Elijah and Elisha. The man who was being buried and when his bones were thrown into the bones of Elisha, he rose again. Moses, who was taken from his grave on top of Mount Nebo by God. All of them, they were resurrected as tokens of a symbol of faith in the one who will rise again and shall in his resurrection guarantee the resurrection of all others. Let me be very clear, beyond any possible reasonable doubt, Christ rose from the dead. There is no shadow of a doubt. He lives. And as the singers Bill and Gloria Gaither put it very well in their song. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Our children can face uncertain days precisely because he lives. We can still plan for the future in the midst of COVID. We study and we look forward to graduating knowing very well there is COVID. We are getting married in the midst of COVID. We, we are applying for new jobs. We are starting new businesses. How could we be that foolish? When death is such a guarantee, why are we wasting our energies on tomorrow? When COVID says, there's a high probability I'll take you out. We look at death in the face every day with our knowledge that Jesus lives. 
when we plan for tomorrow, it is our act of defiance on death to say to death, lest you forget, he lives. And because he lives, all tomorrow and its possibilities belongs to us. And because he lives, you killing us no longer makes our lives lives that we are afraid to live. We know now we are going to die. But that knowledge is a drop in the ocean compared to the knowledge that then after, in the twinkling of an eye, with the sound of the archangel's trumpet, we will live again. And that life will never be taken away because he lives. He lives. And the knowledge that he lives, even before he had come to die, that knowledge was already changing how people were living their lives. Even before he came to die, the prophecy that after his death, he would live again, that was enough to make Job face death and poverty and sickness and abandonment and say to all of it, I know that my Redeemer lives. It is a powerful thing to know that Jesus lives. Especially for those of us who live after he died and rose again. If the knowledge that he would live was so powerful that it shaped Job's resistance at the face of an attack, even before Jesus was born, how much more should that knowledge fuel our defiance against the arrogance and the evil of sin? The knowledge that Christ would live is the same knowledge as Paul tells us that when, when Abraham was on top of Mount Moriah, when he had almost killed Isaac and the angel stopped him. And for us, that is where the story ends. But Paul says the story didn't end there. Because Abraham had trusted God, God then revealed to him the meaning of everything. Why he had asked him to come to Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac. Then God showed Moses the cross of Calvary where Christ would die. Where God would offer his one and only son. But unlike Abraham, no one would stop God. His son would die. Then when God showed Abraham the resurrection that God himself expected to fulfill by faith in himself. When Abraham saw that resurrection, then he saw the second coming of Jesus. He saw the end of sin. He saw the end of death and suffering. Then he went down that mountain and he ran home with the servants and his son. And when he got home, this multimillionaire of, of, of a trader from the Middle East who was still preparing to build himself a mansion, he came home and he took the architect's plans and the builder's plans and he 
before all of them. And when the wife said, why are you tearing the plans of our dream home? And he replied, I have beheld a city whose maker and builder is God himself. And because I saw him die and rise again, I no longer want any city in this world. I am aiming for that city that will be built on the foundation of his resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus does not just transform the lives of those living today. It was the engine and the power that fueled those who lived even before he was born. When Daniel was given an opportunity to look through time, to, to watch the history unfold. And when Daniel looked through history and he saw the crucifixion of Jesus and he thought, could this be the end? And then he was shown a vision in Daniel 7 and the thrones were set and he beheld what John would see in Revelation 5, he saw the lion of the tribe of Judah entering the heavenly courts, having died for mankind and risen again. This very Daniel, when he was told, now you go and rest. He departed from history with joy. He had seen the greatest vision of all when he said, then shall Michael, the great prince of his people, stand. All these people, they pinned their hopes in the resurrection of Jesus. Everything they had ever done, every prophecy they had ever given, every verse they had ever written, all persecution, all doubt, all insult, all of it for them became worth it when they saw what would happen when Jesus rises again, when they saw what the resurrection of Jesus would produce. Dying for this gospel was worth it. Being mocked for this gospel became worth it. Being poor for the gospel became worth it to them. Being rich for the gospel became worth it for them because God made them see where the future of the world was going and that all of it would be pinned on that Sunday morning when Christ takes his first breath on his third day in the grave. He lives. He lives. And because he lives, I have so much more reason to be defiant. More defiant than those who merely saw his resurrection in visions when his birth had not even happened. If they moved by his resurrection, not having even seen his birth, but when they saw the visions of his resurrection, if they said, death be damned, poverty be damned, riches be damned, we will not lose our faith because we've seen what the future will look like. How much more should there be defiance on those who live after his birth and resurrection.
when when Abraham first saw and heard the promise of a son that would make him the father of nations, when he believed it by faith and God vowed it and at Mount Moriah he revealed it, there were yet going to be over 2,000 years before Christ would be born. But faith was enough. It was enough to make Abraham cross those 2,000 years in one day. Faith brought him to a time he would not live in to see a descendant of his who is actually God in the flesh. Faith was enough to then make Abraham leave that moment and be transported into the very second coming of Jesus and behold the heavens. When Moses was first given the vision, when Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 15, saying to the Israelites, one greater than me is coming when he gave them this promise because he had seen what would happen, there would be yet still over 1,300 years before such a thing would happen. Yet faith would allow Moses to cross that span of time. And at the transfiguration, he was there to see the first part of it all. We are not the first to have to wait hundreds, if not thousands of years before God fulfills his plan. Those who waited the first time for him just to be born. Some saw the vision 2000 years before time. Some a thousand, some 600 years some 400 years before it happened. And although prophets like Anna, prophets like Zechariah were able to say, praise be to the Lord our God for in our days we have seen the fulfillment of the promise of Israel. There are those who had died 2,000 years before, who had seen it in visions but never got to see it in real. Yet in their death, they never complained. They never felt left out. They never felt the time was too long because faith transported them to that moment. And when they died, they were not different to those who would be alive when he came the first time. Faith gave them the full experience of his coming the first time. And even now, those who are waiting for his second coming, we are not the first to wait for his coming. We can also reflect and say it's been 2000 years since he promised that he was coming again. And indeed, like those who were waiting for the first time, many of us will die having not seen him come again. But let me assure you, as God did it for the first group, so he can and will and is doing it for us by faith. We can go to the second coming of Jesus. We can see him descend in the clouds of glory. We can see him put those crowns on us. And we can come back to this life and be able to say to each and every day, you will not intimidate me. By faith, I've been there. I've seen myself rise from the dead. I've seen him say to me, Come ye blessed of my father, come ye faithful servants, come enter into my joy, come and enjoy the kingdom that had been prepared for you even before the foundations of the world were laid. We can 
we can, we can today by faith say to life what Abraham said to life. Abraham was not there when Jesus was born. But the man lived like he and Jesus lived at the same time. Because faith, faith took what would happen in the future and brought it into his life at that moment. And Abraham no longer lived as one who died before the promise was fulfilled. Moses no longer lived as one who died before the promise was fulfilled. David having been told that one of his descendants will one day say to my Lord, sit here while I prepare a place for your Lord. When David understood this, he no longer lived as one who would be unfortunate and die before the Messiah comes. All of them, faith gave them access to the coming of the Messiah. And they no longer feared life because they knew what Jesus would do for them. Don't be afraid. Let faith take you to his second coming because he has risen again. This life has nothing to steal from us anymore. Our resurrection is guaranteed in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that tomorrow no longer has troubles over us because you live. Take us through faith. Transport us to our resurrection and your second coming. Let us live every day as those who will no longer be intimidated because you live. We thank you for what you did. We thank you for what it means for us today. And we'll... My name Cindy. Yes, you had um, gone quiet, Pastor. I think uh, when your screen went blank, you went quiet. We couldn't hear you. All right. It was just at that prayer part. I have finished power cut off as I was praying. So the oh. device, the devices had to move from the house Wi-Fi to the data. That is why it cut off, but I was done. Okay. Uh, what does the church say? Because Amen. 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 he lives, Amen. we can face tomorrow. Yes, Amen. because he lives. And to close off, uh, we'll close with this song. And then one day, we'll cross that river. And fight lies far in our war with pain. And then is dead, his way to victory. I'll see the light of glory and I'll know he reigns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know oh, he wants the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Because Jesus 
Jesus lives, we Amen. can see face tomorrow. If you can uh, close us once again, Pastor, uh, with a word of prayer, and then we dismiss. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time you've allowed us to spend in the study of your word in the book of Matthew throughout since we began the year. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for that guidance. We've learned so much. We pray that you would commit this book into our memory. And as we move on to the next chapters of what you want us to learn, I plead with you that your Holy Spirit may be with us that he would guide us. I pray that none may exalt themselves. I pray that the name of no mortal may be remembered, but only the name of Jesus. I pray that you may make available to us all the resources we need to keep all your ministries going whatever is necessary for us to continue to serve you, I pray that you would make available. I pray for your children who day in and day out are dedicated to come here to hear your word. Not because I or any of my colleagues who present here are eloquent, gifted, or gods of any shape or form, but merely because your children love you and want to be saved. I thank you for the opportunity to minister to them and to ourselves. Amen. I thank you that you have entrusted me and my colleagues with these, your great people and their salvation. And I pray that everything we teach may bring only glory and honor to your name. Mm. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you may bless each and every one of us with the resources that we need to serve you. Some need courage, some need a voice, some need money, some need time. There are so many things that we need in order to serve you. Mm. I would plead and pray that you do not allow us to run short of such. If there be any facing death who still wants to serve you, mm. Lord, let there be life in them in the name of Jesus. If there be any facing unemployment and poverty who desires to fund your work, Lord, open you the windows of heaven, your storehouse. If there be any who likes and desires to preach your gospel, but they lack a voice and courage, Lord, let your spirit fill them as it did Moses. If there be any who is impatient with you, and feels that you are taking too long. Give them the faith and the patience you granted Sarah. To patiently wait upon you till you release the power. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you may bless each and every member of this group. I pray for their families. I pray that the struggles they face may never take them away from you. I pray that you may protect our wives, our children and husbands. I pray that Heavenly Father in you, when our family members have found no joy in us, let them still find joy in you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the evil one may not prevail against your church. I pray, Heavenly Father, that your church may stand solid and firm in the mission you've given it of the Advent message. That this gospel may be preached 
to all the ends of the world for you to come. As your servant David prayed, I ask that you do not make us poor, that we question whether you are really there. Neither make us so rich and so gluttonous that we forget that all things come through you. Mm -hmm. I ask, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit may always be among us. I ask that your Holy Spirit may fill my home, fill me and my family. That your Holy Spirit may move within, without, and hover in everything that we've got. And I pray this not only for me, but it is a worthy gift that it be done for all of us. Amen. I pray, Heavenly Father, that where you, by your wisdom, have allowed the evil one to touch their finances, now heal and repair. Where you have allowed the evil one to touch their health, now restore. Where you have allowed by your wisdom that we should be tested when our relationships are shaken. Now bring the trust, forgiveness, and healing. I pray, Heavenly Father, that where we lack comfort, be our comforter. Where we have turned to drugs and alcohol and pornographic addictions, now bring deliverance and turn us to you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the love of your word may always be in us. I pray that your blessings be sprinkled in the path of all your children. Let those who are studying excel. Let those who are running the businesses be diligent. Let those who are in employed be exemplary. Let those who are raising children be filled with your spirit. Let those heavenly father who find themselves lacking direction for where to go, let your light shine the way. And when all is said and done, may our names be written in the book of life. May the blood of Jesus seal and confirm our redemption. And may we continually dwell in your presence all the days of our lives. This we pray through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And let all who believe say.